We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Who's excited to be in God's house this morning? Yeah. Those of you we have room for, right? Uh, <laughs> hey, we're really excited about this series that we're in right now. We're going through the book of James together. So if you grab a copy of God's Word and open up to James chapter 2 is where we're going to be today. We're going to cover the first 13 verses of James chapter 2. Hey, if you don't own a Bible, uh, we want to fix that. So just grab the Bible under the chair in front of you, write your name in it, and take it home with you, all right? That's yours to keep. Um, but we're going to be looking at James chapter 2. While you're opening up to James, I want to share with you a story. There was a, a man who, who died, and when he got to heaven, he was looking around, and it's such an amazing place, he got a little lost. So he asked one of the angels to show him around. And so an angel was like, yeah, I'll, I'll show you around. And as he's walking around, he noticed on this really big mountain, uh, this hill, there's this huge mansion, a giant mansion. And it's just decked out in everything ravens. I mean, there's like flags leading up. It's purple. The house is painted purple. I mean, it's just incredible. Whatever. He's noticing that. But they're walking down these other streets of gold, and there's these other houses. And he notices all of these, uh, these different houses that have been decked out in different NFL teams, like a lot of fans, I guess, of NFL uh, in heaven, all right? So he's, he's asking different questions. He notices he passes a house, and it's all decked out in, in cowboy stuff. And he's like, oh, wow, that must have been maybe a famous player, uh, and maybe that's their house. And they go down a little further, and there's a Steelers, and they're like, oh, wow, that's cool. But he keeps noticing this big house at the top with all the Raven stuff, and he's thinking, I, I, I wonder... Whose house is that? I mean, the Ravens are pretty new. They're not that old of a team. He's trying to think of maybe they're preparing a house for like Jonathan Ogden or something. He eventually asks, whose house is that? And I'm like, well, that's God's house, right? <laughs> now today we're going to talk about favoritism. We're going to talk about favoritism today. The Bible says that God doesn't have any favorites, but I think we can all agree, right? If he had a football team to choose, it would be... <laughs> little secret I'm actually more of an Eagles fan than I am a Ravens fan but I know my audience all right today we're going to talk about something called the sin of favoritism we're going to look at what the Bible says about favoritism you might know this word by other words maybe you use the word prejudice or uh, we have, you know, favoritism ends with the ISM, the isms, right? Maybe you know of racism, sexism, classism, ableism, all these things that we do that we, we look at other people and we tend to make judgment calls and, and, and cause divisions. The first thing I think we ought to do is define what is favoritism. If the Bible says that it's a sin, what is it so that we cannot do it, Right? And here's what it's, uh, like a dictionary definition says this. It's the practice of giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or a group of people at the expense of another. And so that's a, a pretty well-known definition, but I think it's missing something. So I'm going to add to it. It's actually showing preference to one individual or group of people over another that have an equal claim because we all do occasionally show preferential treatment to one person or another in a situation where there's not an equal claim. For example, if you go to a concert and one guy has a ticket to get in and another guy does not have a ticket to get in, they're going to show preferential treatment to the guy with the paid ticket, right? He doesn't have, uh, the guy without a ticket doesn't have an equal claim to get into the concert because he didn't buy a ticket. Likewise, if, if uh, uh, maybe there's a woman who would complain, well, Matt uh, shows favoritism to his wife over me. Well, I want you to understand, yes, that's not favoritism. You don't have an equal claim to my attention and affection as my wife does, right? 
If a, if a business says first come, first serve, and everybody arrives before you and gets the thing, and you don't, they didn't show favoritism, they just had a policy, and you were late, right? So favoritism is when two people have an equal claim, and then what you do, or we do, is show a preferential treatment to one of them over the other, and, and the question is, why do we do that? And, and the, the real answer to it, uh, not why we do it, but the answer to favoritism ultimately is that God says it's a sin. It's something we should not do. And we're going to explore that this morning in James chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 13. I want you to know that I struggle a little bit uh, with favoritism, and I'll give you an example of that. This service right here, 10 o'clock, this is my favorite service. Yeah. Now, if you could do me a favor and don't tell the other services I said that, and even more importantly, don't show up to the other services so you don't know I said that to them too, that would be helpful. Um, no, but let's talk about favoritism. Uh, you know, when we think about all the isms of Scripture, all the ways that today we show favoritism. We show favoritism by looking at people, uh, we, we have the, like, how about racism, right? We look at people and judge them based on their race, or maybe it's classism. We see some people as more worthy of our affection and attention than others based on how wealthy or impoverished they are. Or maybe it's based on gender, you know, sexism. You treat men differently than you treat women. Uh, maybe it's ableism, right? You see someone who's able-bodied and you give them preferential treatment over someone who is not able-bodied. And, and, and that's a problem. And I, I found a video on YouTube I want to use to kind of paint this picture. And what it is, is a guy did a social experiment. It's the same gentleman in both of these clips. And what he is, he's going to walk out in public one time dressed as a homeless man, and another time dressed as a well-to-do, maybe a wealthy businessman. And in both situations, he's going to collapse, uh, maybe choking, maybe having a heart attack, who knows. And let's just see how people react. <laughs> <laughs> Coughing a little bit. You are? <laughs> All right. All right, thanks. Appreciate it. You're good? Yeah. Yeah. Water. <laughs> yeah, I'll fix it. What does this video teach us, right? I think what it teaches us if you're going to choke, do it in nice clothing. <laughs> but that's unfortunate because that shouldn't be the message of that video, right? The video is showing something that's true about all of us, something that we struggle with, where we, we make these judgment calls, we show favoritism to some people over another. That video went on. One thing you didn't get to see is how long that, that homeless gentleman laid on the ground and at some point really almost curled up to the point where he looked like he was dead and people just walked over him. Nobody came to his aid. It's terrible. And yet, it's something that we experience, and the Bible addresses very clearly in James chapter 2. So if you're taking notes this morning, we're going we're gonna to write down a few things. The first thing I want you to write down regarding the sin of favoritism is favoritism doesn't reflect Jesus. Now, all of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, what you should want to do, right, is you want to allow other people to see Jesus in you. Uh, for some people, you're the only Jesus they're ever going to see. The way you interact, the way you behave, the things you do and say. Oh, I want to be the light. I want to reflect the light of Jesus out of my life and into other people. But when you show favoritism, according to James, you are not reflecting Jesus. It says in James chapter 2 verse 1, My dear brothers and sisters. So don't miss this. James is talking to believers. He's talking to Christians who ought to know better. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Christ Jesus if you favor some people over others? Now we know, even in this verse, right, 
that Jesus is the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. All right, let's look at another verse. In Deuteronomy, you can stay in James, but in Deuteronomy 10, 17, it says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. What does scripture say about the way we ought to, to understand God, right? He doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't show partiality. And it also goes on to say he can't be bribed. In other words, you can't buy his, 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 his partiality. You can't buy favoritism. I remember when I was younger, there were multiple instances where my family would go out to eat and we'd walk into like an outback or we'd walk into an Applebee's and we'd go up, my, my dad would go up to the, the host stand and, and put the, his name in and they would say, it's, it's going to be about a 75 minute wait, right? Have you ever been in that situation before and the spokesperson comes over and y'all huddle, right? And you say, all right, what are we going to do? We're we going, are we staying, what are we doing, right? Well, my dad, he would hear that and he would turn back and he'd go back over to the stand and he would do something. I never knew quite what was happening, but immediately he would turn around and say, all right, Osdals, let's go. And we'd all go down and sit down, somehow skipping the 75 minute wait. And I was thinking, what is going on right now? I, I found out towards the end of my dad's life, it was a simple answer. It's called a $20 bill, right? <laughs> like my dad didn't want to wait. And he knew that someone was willing to take 20 bucks in exchange for getting us right to our table. Uh, it's terrible, right? You're like, other, like, I'm the guy who's waiting, right? And yeah, well, God cannot be bribed. You can't go up to God with just enough money and enough whatever and say, God, I'm the one who's gonna, let, I'll hook you up if you hook me up. There's no quid pro quo with Jesus. He doesn't show favoritism. And the reason why, I remember, is that favoritism is when people are shown preferential treatment who have equal claim. And the truth is that when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see you as someone who has more of a claim or less of a claim than other people to his love. Jesus loves every single person that, because listen to this, Jesus made every single one of you in this room and every single person outside of this building, all people have been made in the image of God. And so when he sees people, he doesn't see them as some worthier of his affection and some worthier of his love. He sees all people with an equal claim to his attention and God doesn't show favoritism. Even the Pharisees knew this. In Matthew 22, the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus. They say some, uh, they sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod. Like, hey, let's get some religious guys. Let's get some government guys. And let's try to trick Jesus when it comes to taxes. And it says they met with him and they said, teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. And then this is what they say about him. You are impartial. And you don't play favorites. And they're about to try to get Jesus to play favorites, aren't they? Like, Jesus, are you going to pick us? Or are you going to pick Herod? Or You're supposedly impartial. What? So they even know this about our Jesus. So if we understand that Jesus doesn't take bribes, he, he doesn't show a favoritism, he doesn't play favorites, what it means is that when you do, you're not reflecting Jesus. You see, all of us have been created in the image of God. We all have an equal claim. And all, make sure you don't miss this, every single one of you in this room, you are equally loved by God. Here's the second thing I want you to see from James. And the sin of favoritism is favoritism focuses on the wrong things. In other words, when you show favoritism to one group of people over another group of people with an equal claim... What you're doing in that moment, you don't even realize it, but you are focusing on things that don't matter in your judgment call. The things that ultimately matter to God are not what you're focusing on in that moment. So James introduces this with kind of a, an analogy. And here's what he says in James chapter 2, verse 2. He says, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. 
By the way, the only way you could even notice that, imagine if that happened right now, that in the back of the room, coming into our gathering, two people entered the room, two, two men entered the room. One was dressed in fancy clothes, covered in expensive jewelry, and the other was a probably homeless and had dirty clothes. And clearly, what we would do is we would use our senses. We would use our eyes, maybe our noses. Maybe one of them smelled really great and another one did not smell too well. Uh, we would maybe use our ears. Maybe one of them was making some weird sounds and maybe, uh, you know, saying something a little off and the other one was polite. And, and so we're going to use all of our senses and we're going to focus on things that are external. We're going to focus on the things that our senses can pick up on the outside. And so James sets up this analogy, and what he's doing is he's showing us that when that happens, when two people enter the back of a room, what we're likely to do because of our human nature is to make a judgment call based on the wrong things, based on outward things. There was a girl who started dating this guy, and this guy had all the outward signs of being a bad dude. I mean, she was dating him, and she knew at some point she was going to have to introduce him to her parents. But this guy, I mean, he had all the, the, he had, you know, he dressed all in black, and he had tattoos all over his face, and he had piercings all over the place. And this girl was like, well, I, I really like this guy, so I got to introduce him to my parents. And so she does. She introduces him to the parents. The parents are a little worried, right? They're like, are you sure? Are you sure this is the guy for you? He seems like a bad dude. And they're like, listen, you can't judge a book by the cover, mom and dad. If he was so bad, would he be doing 500 hours of community service? <laughs> listen, sometimes the outward appearance sometimes maybe matches up with some, some things that you're making assumptions about, but sometimes they don't. And it's not up to you to determine whether or not you're just like, I just got it all figured out. Usually when I guess these things, I'm right. I can tell you a lot about a person just by looking at them. That might be true for some people. You might be better at getting it right than other people. But the Bible says that when you show favoritism, what you're really doing is you're making a decision about a person based on the wrong things, things that you see and not what's going on in the heart. You know, when it says the word, uh, the, the man came into the room with fancy clothes and expensive jewelry. Remember that, that phrasing, that word expensive jewelry, if you translate it from the Greek, it actually translates to gold ringed. In other words, a man comes in who is gold ringed. And what that means is that back in the day, if you were wealthy, the way you would show it was by putting gold rings, on, not just on one finger, but you'd put gold rings, not just on all your fingers, but you'd put a lot of gold rings on as many fingers as you could afford, right? You take all your gold rings and you put them on all your fingers and you walk around and basically the more gold you were wearing on your fingers, the wealthier and the more to do you were. So James uses this example to say, listen, imagine a guy walks in with all, not just a few little signs of wealth. But I mean, he's decked out. His, his, he's, his fingers are covered in gold. And then someone else comes in with very little. You see, what we're doing there is we're making a judgment call based on what we see. Uh, I can imagine if, if someone were to call the church office this week and they were to call Michelle, my assistant, right? And the, the phone call sounded something like this. The guy on the other end of the phone says, I need to talk to the the head hog in the pig pen. I assume my assistant would say, excuse me? I said, I need to talk to the head hog in that there pig pen. And Michelle would probably say, I believe you're talking about our lead pastor, and I believe it's a little disrespectful to address him that way. Right? And then if the other person on the other end of the phone said, listen, I'm about to write a $50,000 check for your building fund, but I need to first talk to the head hog in that pig pen. My assistant would probably say, well, let me get that big fat pig for you right now, right? <laughs> and here's why. is because we tend to, to, to value things like, like money and wealth and things that are external 
when at the end of the day, we're supposed to be focused on things. I'm not picking on Michelle, sorry. <laughs> but so, seriously, transfer them right to me. Um, <laughs> There's a passage of scripture in the New Testament where uh, Samuel is selecting and anointing someone who's going to be the future king of Israel. And if you know the story, David is going to be the one. David is this little, little, you know, pipsqueak, and he's out, uh, he's out, you know, with the sheep. He's a shepherd, and all his brothers seem like they're much more. Uh, it fit to be king of Israel. So as Samuel is sitting there, he's looking at all of these different guys. And then he says this in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so the problem is when we show prejudice towards other people in those moments, we are making a judgment call about things that are the wrong things when we ought to be reflecting the truth that all people have been created in the image of God. And God looks at that truth. He looks at the heart, not at the outward. God sees what really matters. All right, let's look at uh, the, the next thing, the sin of favoritism. Number three, favoritism sees others as objects to be used. I hope you don't miss the power of what I just said. When you show favoritism to someone, using that analogy of of a couple guys coming into the room and one looks wealthy and well-to-do and the other one looks uh, poor and destitute, what you're doing in that moment is, is you're technically, when you show prejudice, what you're doing is you're making a judgment call that sounds something like this. What can each of these guys do for me? Instead of seeing them as image bearers of God, you're seeing them as objects and you're making a judgment call based on, all right, if I have the wealthy person come up and sit in the seat of honor, well, there's probably some things that could be good from that. That'll, it'll be great for the church. If this guy maybe is, is generous, it could be really good for me. If maybe this guy has a lot of great connections and it's going to be great from a, a comfort perspective. He's not going to maybe smell funny or interrupt the service or do anything weird. And so why don't we have that person come and sit here? You see, what I'm doing in that moment is I'm treating a person like an object to determine what can I get out of this exchange. Likewise, what you're doing when you choose not to show preferential treatment to another individual or group of people is you're making a judgment call, again, on what will happen if I show, if I bring someone in and who's homeless and maybe smells funny and is wearing dirty clothes and I give them the seat of honor, well, now I have to worry about, well, now we're going to have to clean that seat. And there's going to be a whole group of people who are going to be really uncomfortable. And, and we're starting to make calls again about our level of comfort. All of it is all geared towards what is this going to mean for me? That's what happens when you show favoritism. You're making a judgment call that treats other people like objects to be used. James chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. The story goes on. It says, if you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? And that's what exactly what James is talking about. What, it, what he's talking about when he says guided by evil motives, he's talking about the truth that when you show favoritism, when you show racism, when you show sexism, ableism, classism, all the isms, what you're doing in that moment is you're being guided by that evil sin nature that makes you want to know what is in it for me. What do I get out of this? That's ultimately what sin is, if you think about it. Sin is when you say, you know what? I'm going to put my preferences and my desires over the desires and preferences of God and other people. I'm going to put me first. And when you show favoritism, that's exactly what you're doing. You're putting yourself first. 
Let's keep reading in James chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. It says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? L let me tell you first what I think James is saying here. If you're, point number four in your notes regarding the sin of favoritism is favoritism is the world's way. Favoritism is the way of the world. It's not the way of the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of man, not the kingdom of God. If you think about it, you know, when, when Jesus came to this earth, he lived for 33 years. When he started his ministry, at some point, he got on this, this mountain, right? We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And he got up and he preached this, this sermon. And in this sermon, it starts in chapter 5 of Matthew. He, he preaches this uh, the little first bar, part of the sermon we call the Beatitudes, and in the Beatitudes, one of the things that Jesus goes out of his way to communicate is, listen, the way that this world thinks is different than the way I think. And the way this world thinks ought to be different than the way my children think. Let me read a passage of scripture for you. In Matthew 5, in the, the Beatitudes, it says, and starting in verse 1, now then, or when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, just pause right there. The world already will tell you that that's the wrong way to go, right? Who, who's, who's blessed in this world? The people who got a lot of stuff are the ones who are blessed in this world. But Jesus says, not in my kingdom, not in my upside-down way of thinking. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And this goes on. I, for the sake of time, I didn't put the entirety of the Beatitudes, but the point is, what Jesus is trying to say here is, my kingdom is very different from the kingdom of this world. The way this world behaves and thinks and processes things, it's different than the way it should. And so when you show favoritism and you make these judgment calls based on outward appearances, what you're really doing in that moment is you're making judgment calls on the wrong things. And then you're taking those, those the judgment call you're making isn't the same judgment call that Jesus would make. It's the judgment call the world would make in that moment. You see, our world, one of the things that our world loves to do is divide people into categories and labels. Listen to this. Don't miss this. Our world loves to label you. Our world loves to take certain people and say, all right, you belong over here in the category of black, and you belong over here in the category of white. You belong over here in the category of man. You belong over here in the category of woman. Here's another label for you. You are wealthy, and you are poor. Our, our community, our, our world loves to assign different labels, and some of the labels, they tell you, these are the most important labels. These are the ones that you should like everything you do ought to be based on these labels. But here's the thing about the kingdom of God. We all have been made in the image of God. We all are image bearers of God. And the truth is that when you give your life to Christ, the only identifying label that really should matter for you at that point on is I am a child of the king. I don't care your skin color. I don't care your hair color. I don't care if you're tall. I don't care if you, uh, what language you speak. I don't care where you're from. I don't care if you're rich or you're poor. Listen, if you love Jesus, you are my brother and my sister in Christ. That's all that matters to me. The world loves to divide people. And when we see this sin of favoritism, what we're doing is we're playing into the world's label games and saying, all right, I can quickly identify you belong in this category, you belong in this category, and I'm going to treat your categories differently. Though, you're both made in the image of God. 
And that's wrong. It's the world's way. Galatians 3, 28 says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, no longer slave or free, no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying to the church in Galatia here is simply put, you are all brothers and sisters in Christ now. These other labels that the world gave you, they're not important to me. All right, let's look at the fifth thing, the sin of favoritism. I want you to know that favoritism breaks the law of love, which is a big deal. Write big deal in all caps, all right? I want you to know that it's a big deal. It might just seem like a little petty sin. You're like, well, there's people who do much worse things than me. I just every once in a while show favoritism to someone. But I want you to understand that when you break the law of love, the Bible says this is a really big problem. It's not a small sin. It's a big deal. Let's, let's look at what James says. In James 2, verse 8, we hear the golden rule, which we call the law of love. It says, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible tells you, right, that you have to love your neighbor as yourself. You learn this in like uh, pre-K. The golden rule, right from God's word. It says, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. Now, let's not miss that first part, all right? If you show favoritism, you show prejudice, racism, sexism, ableism, all those, if you favor one group of people over another, the Bible's really clear, that is called sin. But let's keep looking at this, right? That is sin. But it says, you are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the laws, except one, is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. What God's word says is that if you break one law, you go into this category of people called lawbreakers. If you break all of God's laws, you go into the same category called lawbreakers. God doesn't show favoritism. All lawbreakers. Raise your hand in this room real quick if you're a lawbreaker. Broken one of God's laws. Uh, but if your hand's not down, you just lied, so raise your hand right here. <laughs> That's all of us in this room. We all are guilty of breaking the law. But what James does next is really interesting. If you want to know how serious of a sin is favoritism, James does something really weird in verse 11. Here's what he says. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but you do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. I'm thinking, what in the world does this have to do with favoritism? Now we're talking about murder and adultery. Well, here's what James is doing. He's like, I know we're talking about favoritism. I just told you that if you break one law, it's like the same as being guilty of all of them. The same punishment, same problem. And then he brings murder and adultery into the picture. What he's simply trying to say is, if you think favoritism is no big deal, I'm going to mention them in the same list that I mentioned murder and adultery. When you show favoritism to someone else, it's like you're guilty of murder and adultery. It all breaks the law of love. What it does, ultimately, like, kind of the, the understanding the heart of sin when it's against someone else is what you're really doing in that moment is that you're rejecting the image of God in another person. In fact, let me make sure you, you hear that. Prejudice, favoritism, Racism, sexism, ableism, classism, whatever it is, all of those things reject the image of God in another person. What you're doing when you do that is you're saying, listen, I believe that this person over here has been made in the image of God, and I believe this person over here has not been made in the image of God. Or I believe this person was more made in the image of God and this person has less of the image of God in them. But the truth is, how cool would it be if all of us, and this is a, a prayer that maybe you should pray on a daily basis. God, would you allow my eyes to see people the way you see them? Would you allow my eyes to see that every single person you made has been made in the image of God? 
I don't know how many of you out here, it's going to be kind of a crazy shopping week for a lot of you, right? Some of you do the whole Black Friday thing and Saturday and the cyber or Sunday or what, I don't know. Whatever it is that you're doing, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to frustrate you this week. You're going to have people come into your house sitting around a table that you prefer to only see once a year, <laughs> right? And, and here's the deal. You ready for this? Every single one of those people, the guy who cuts in front of you in line or takes that parking spot that you were waiting for, that person was made in the image of God. How cool would it be if we could see people that way? That when we see someone choking on the street, we don't notice at all what it is they're wearing. We just see an image bearer of God who's struggling and we step in to help. So we always end our messages with this question, what now, God? I have a, a, that question that we ask to God and we say, God, what do you want us to do with this information? And what I wanna do is I wanna read the last two verses of James chapter, uh, of our passage, James chapter two, verse 12 and 13. And here's what James says. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. So I want you to ask yourself a few questions this morning. Here's the first question. Where do you show favoritism? Or how about this? Where are you prejudiced towards others? And by the way, this is, these last two questions can be really hard for you to answer yourself. You've got to go to God and ask him. And maybe even better than just, and not better than asking God, God's the best person you can ask, all right? Go to God and say, God, where do I show prejudice that I don't even know I do it? And to add to that, maybe you need to go to someone who's close to you and say, hey, do I show favoritism or prejudice in some way that I don't even recognize? Maybe other people see something in you that you've been unable to see, a blind spot. Where do you judge people by what you see? And what I want us to do instead of those, those, those acts of, those decisions of favoritism is simply this, to affirm the image of God in others. I want to invite you to affirm the image of God in other people. And what I want to challenge you to do this week, maybe even today, I want you to find one person. And as an exercise to practice this, I want you to affirm the image of God in them. Say, hey, I want you to know I see the image of God in you. And affirm that. Maybe someone that you would naturally be prejudiced against or a dislike for some reason. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your perfect law. We thank you so much for this book that we can open up on Sundays. We can study it together. We can learn more about who you are. God, we want to be transformed and released by the love of Jesus. We want to be transformed into your likeness. We want to be more and more like you. And we know that in order to do that, we have to see other people the way you see them. Help us to get rid of all prejudice, all racism, all classism, ableism, sexism, all favoritism. God, would you let us get rid of all of that and simply see the people that we interact with on a daily basis as humans that have been created in your image. Would you allow us to see what really matters, the fact that you love them, that you sent your son on, on, to the cross to die in their place? Would you allow us to treat them with the kind of love that you show them? Because we know you love them, God. We want to love them too. Help us to get better and better at that. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.